Hello and welcome to the Government Technology Insider Podcast. Today we have an incredibly timely and important show. Joining us are three experts who are going to elaborate on the unique communications challenges that the government is facing during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. We're also going to talk about how COVID-19 could create real problems for governments and agencies should they have to respond to other emergency situations during the pandemic. Now, if you're a returning listener to the Government Technology Insider podcast, you, you might not recognize my voice. So let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Ryan Traden. I'm a contributor to the Government Technology Insider, where I cover satellite, cyber, and digital transformation. I'm also the executive editor of the Government Satellite Report, one of the leading publications covering the ways in which the government is utilizing satellite resources and facing new threats in the space domain. Joining me for this discussion are uh, three very exciting guests with incredible public sector qualifications. They are John Harris of Verizon, Kale Teeter Gregg of Gotenna, and G. Ramos Carr of FES Government Solutions. Gentlemen, how are you all holding up? Is everyone staying at home as per social distancing guidelines and best practices? Hey, Ryan, it's John of Verizon. And yes, we are adhering to all uh, guidelines and uh, doing everything we can to stay home and stay safe and uh, doing very well. Thank you so much for having us on the podcast today and uh, excited to uh, to have the conversation. Thank you again. Hey, Ryan, this is Kale from Gotenna. And yes, uh, we at Gotenna are also uh, uh, upholding all of the stay at home rules and social distancing. Um, so we're excited to be able to uh, chat with you today and have conversations that are outside of our home. This is G. Ramos from SES Government Solutions, and uh, we here are also working from home uh, 100% for you know personnel that are able to. All the uh, staff that have to man the teleports and the knocks are uh, adhering to social distancing while still completing their jobs on site. But it's been a uh, dramatic change from the norm for us, but we are uh, surviving. Well, I- I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I'm especially glad that you're all able to dial in and join the discussion today. And yes, listeners, we are recording this over the phone because we're all doing what we can to flatten the curve like a good citizen. And and, and that's a good segue because the coronavirus has been incredibly impactful to our world. It's, It's changed how we work. It's changed how we live, what we can do, how we teach our kids, whether we can walk our dogs without masks. And and it's rapidly jumping the shark for pretty much everyone in this country. And I would assume around the world. Uh, but has it changed our communication needs, John? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I think what it's really done for us at Verizon is highlighted the importance of the network and the importance of connectivity uh, as people are now you know, working in very different environments than they did previously. So as we all just highlighted, we're all in different places than we would normally be and all have very different communication needs Uh, as do all of our customers and all of our government uh, agencies that are helping to respond to this pandemic. I thought it'd be interesting to give you some of the the statistics that Verizon has seen uh, as to how this pandemic has changed the needs of communication. So, for example, we're seeing, uh, you know, over a baseline period, about a 9 or 10 percent increase in total wireless data consumption. Uh, But interestingly, at the same time, almost a 35 percent decrease in the number of times those mobile devices are handing off from one cell tower to another. So obviously a lot of people using more data, but doing so in a very sort of stable way. They're not moving. They're staying at home and and connecting from the same spot. Uh, Also, interestingly, you know, as people are now connecting to uh, web conferences versus uh, live meetings, et cetera, we're seeing uh, increases in call times. So just the the number of minutes that people are staying on the phone has increased by almost 45 percent. Uh, so, you know, a very different sort of pattern and flow of how we're seeing traffic on the network. Uh, and text messages, as you can imagine, are, are really, really high. We're up about uh, 9 billion per day uh, over the norm. So, you know, some pretty dramatic changes to the way people are consuming uh, the network and how uh, how we're responding to, you know, to this pandemic. So uh, what we're also seeing is, you know, the, the typical kind of uh, response, if you will, for a an emergency scenario is a lot of times centered in particular geographic areas. And it's been really interesting to watch with this response. Uh, those needs are everywhere. Uh, there is no one pocket where this is hitting harder than another. Certainly uh, cities that have got, you know, higher cases uh, than others, uh, but everyone is participating and everyone is needing to use the network. 
uh, in very different ways. And so it's been uh, great to be a part of that. It's been great to help provide those services and mission critical needs uh, as governments and, and citizens are responding uh, and be able to be a part of the solution. So some pretty interesting you know, ways that the uh, the network is being leveraged and uh, our customers are ultimately taking advantage of it to uh, to support their citizens and their communities. That makes sense. I'm sure all of our listeners have their own stories of how they've been relying more on digital services over the past couple of months with everyone staying at home. You know, one of the best ways to, to find the holes in a hose is to turn on the water. And, yeah, you know, like what I mean by that is, like, when you put a system under strain, it's the best way to find its weaknesses. Uh, I'll open this up to, to all three of you. Have, have there been any unexpected weaknesses in our communications infrastructure that have been exposed by the yeah, Ryan, it's John again. I'll jump in quickly and then I'll let my peers uh, give their thoughts as well. The, the thing that's been interesting, I think, for us to see and what many of our customers were maybe uh, un- caught them a little bit off guard was not necessarily the performance of the network itself, but the access to the end devices that, that uh, customers ultimately needed to connect to the network. So hardware and, and uh, you know, customer provided type equipment uh, that was needed. And it was an interesting way that this uh, pandemic, you know, happened, obviously, starting in China, it impacted a number of supply lines and production models. And as it expanded across the, uh, you know, the globe, and obviously here in the United States, we saw increasing demand for some of those uh, peripheral pieces of equipment. And because so much of the supply chain in our country is built on a just-in-time sort of model, it did create a, an interesting supply and demand uh, challenge for us for a little bit of time uh, on how we could provide enough equipment uh, to enough customers, particularly public safety and government customers, to ensure that they could care for their uh, dynamically changing needs in each one of the environments. So we've made some, obviously, key learnings in that uh, that time period and, and been able to adjust. And certainly, I think our customers will do the same. But but that was been, has been an interesting uh, challenge that we wouldn't have typically seen was was access to hardware and equipment. Uh, and as we've gone forward, uh, obviously, look to uh, to find ways to mitigate that as we uh, as we get into future situations or future responses. So, yeah, um, this is Kale. I think one of our biggest challenges that we've faced is because we're a off grid type of solution, and and we work in in environments that are typically not supported by large networks. Um, taking our end users and supporting our end users has been a challenge at doing this through through networks versus uh, being able to do this in person. So I think one of the immediate challenges that, that we have faced is, you know, ensuring that, as, as, he was, as John was talking about, ensuring that we had all the equipment available to us, which was in shortage, you know, as we tried to set up our, our home offices and prepare to do these different types of, of trainings um, and customer, some customer support. Um, without, you know, having that, that office environment. Um, and that is, that has been a significant challenge, um, that we gratefully overcame, um, early on. But, uh, as John said, shortages and equipment and stuff, I, I think that was something that we were not prepared for. This is G from SES Government Solutions. I think that we've seen uh, different utilizations of networks that we're providing. So where communications and terminals were originally purposed or, you know, bought for a resilient communications strategy, we're seeing that users and customers are sending more traffic via diverse routes and using our communication platforms for uh, when they start hitting max congestion on their network rather than when they don't have the network. John said something really interesting before. He was saying that you know normally the the distribution of, of demand for uh, communications and digital services is, is pretty um, you know centralized to certain uh, population centers. And right now, yeah, it, it's kind of universal, blanketed across the country because everyone is online. You know, what are some of the options that communications providers can access when literally everyone comes online at once? Yeah, right. It's John again at at Verizon. I I would say, you know, it's interesting when we think about the mobile environment, um, you know, there are a number of different ways a customer can connect. So certainly, you know, different platforms in terms of a a conferencing service and and being, you know, able to kind of diversify and not have every person using the same type of uh, connection. We're not running out of ports or having, you know, capacity concerns, but even just simple things, you know, on your device, uh, sometimes if folks are, are having challenges connecting, you know, sending a text message or using an application-based service to send messages, there are a number of different ways that the 
uh, mobile devices, you know, anymore can connect us to critical information or to friends and family. The other thing that I think is important to remember is in moments like this for our public safety and uh, first responder customers, uh, one of the things that Verizon takes a tremendous amount of pride in is our ongoing support for the community. And so when we do have situations that there is a high demand for network services, being able to provide uh, priority access to our mobile network or uh, even preemptive services to uh, allow first responders to make sure that those critical communications can get through. We partner uh, aggressively with uh, DHS and uh, the CISA office to ensure that uh, wireless priority services are available uh, in times of need so that first responders can get through. Uh, but the diversity and the number of different uh, ways that people can connect, I think, is important. And too often we get uh, lulled into sleep of using the same mechanism over and over again. I think this has been a good reminder uh, of ensuring we have a backup plan and a secondary plan for communication. Again, whether that's just a different application or a different service, a uh, different type of provider for what uh, we're typically doing day over day. So it's, uh, it's been a good learning. Detail, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we've found that has been helpful in places like New York or some of the initial programs that we created around creating uh, some decentralized um, communication systems. And I know we have valued partners on right now. So um, I'm just talking more about, you know, when we have a, a an emergency um, or disaster that we will have to respond to or that we are responding to, uh, during this COVID crisis, that we do have those alternative communication solutions um, that are available to our first responders that will keep them connected, maybe not at the same level that they're used to with with uh, a Verizon type solution, but um, still keep them connected. And we're still not having to create a lot of extra equipment that agencies are having to, to order in because they're still using those same smart devices uh, and so on to, so that they can keep their connectivity uh, during an emergency response. Yeah, this is G from SES Government Solutions. I would say that uh, the biggest diff deal we've had with uh, customers is them not having terminals and being able to uh, readily utilize our systems or platforms that we already have built and just scaling it up for more usage. And that would be the, the incentive that I would push that certain commands have, have wanted to see is, you know, that they have that initial terminal and connection and all they're looking for is maybe scaling up from like a T1 or a megabit or two megabits to 10 or 20 or 30 um, has been the biggest issue. Yeah, some of the things that we've seen during this pandemic has been a, a big movement towards telehealth. It's a good way for people to still get medical services while social distancing. Also, it's a good way to increase uh, access to care, especially for people in like rural areas. Um, helps uh, medical professionals do more, you know, pack in more visits in their time, which is certainly important right now. So we've seen a, a big movement towards uh, telehealth and telemedicine, um, oftentimes over video. We've seen a big movement towards uh, video teleconferencing. And, and other video-driven communications. You know, gee, what role is satellite playing in enabling that? Yes, yeah, so on the satellite side, we have a, a whole different constellation that our, our traditional geo-synchronous satellites can definitely support telemedicine, telehealth, and uh, distribution of stuff like uh, content about how to social distance. And we've seen USAID and others uh, around the world who are interested in putting up additional channels in neighborhoods where they're used to using satellite communications as their uh, inbound provider for content. But we also have a whole different constellation, our MEO constellation of O3B that provides low latency, a very fiber-like, like intracontinental fiber capability that is going out to space and back with less than 150 milliseconds of delay. And we actually provided this demo to the USNS uh, Mercy and Comfort prior to the COVID response. And uh, they had seen and uh, demonstrated and challenged the, the crew and their partners on the medical side to actually use that technology to see what benefits and what uses they could use it for uh, telemedicine and bringing experts that are maybe located somewhere else into um, either an operating room or a uh, consult for a patient. A lot of the stories that we've been seeing around the coronavirus have been kind of centered around stories of, of uh, you know, compassion and and uh, perseverance from the people on the front lines. A lot of those people are, you know, our first responders and, and our emergency responders. You know, Kale, what's mesh networking do to help support some of those people? 
Well, mesh networking solutions provide, you know, cost-effective communications alternative that can be easily and rapidly deployed. I think the rapidly deployed and easily deployed is the biggest thing because as we become a um, partner with our agencies, um, we help when there isn't that centralized or there's that overburdened uh, system that's in place. If you think about mobile and field hospital communications, uh, the GoTenna Pro, uh, again, will will pair up with smart devices uh, that the end users already have on their uh, person. And then we can provide this this, uh, little small mobile network that isn't going to stress the current network, and it's not gonna require any additional infrastructure. When we're dealing with disaster prone uh, communities, that have to respond uh, during the uh, COVID-19, we ensure that their connectivity is going to be up. If you're talking about some place like Tennessee or Alabama, where we lost some tower sites, um, we were still able to get our first responders up during this event uh, and still maintain that interoperability and connectivity that they uh, might not have during an overburdened uh, type situation that we have right now with our networks. Um, Same thing down on the the border where we're having a lot of stress put on our RF infrastructure uh, and where it's not readily available. Uh, We're creating this this extended network and reaching out to that last mile of of end users and our first first responders on the scene. You're listening to the Government Technology Insider Podcast, where we are discussing the impact of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic on communications infrastructure and government. I'm your host for this episode, Ryan Traden, and today I'm speaking with John Harris of Verizon, G. Ramos from SES Government Solutions, and Kale Tietergreg from Gotenna. Now, gentlemen, because an ongoing global pandemic's not enough to deal with, uh, government agencies are also facing an active tornado season right now, and there are experts that are also saying we could be facing an active hurricane season as well. How will the addition of those kind of emergencies to this coronavirus response effort impact the allocation of resources for critical communications? Hey, Ryan, it's John again at Verizon. I would tell you a couple of things. There's there's two different things I would say we're focusing on. First, internally with uh, our networks and what we can do to help folks prepare for this. Uh, certainly, again, Verizon has had a history of being ready to respond, and we have an entire team dedicated to being uh, first on scene. The Verizon response team is built to uh, be at the front edge of these uh, disasters should they occur, tornadoes, hurricanes, fires, earthquakes, etc. Uh, and so we've been continuing to ramp up these resources to prepare for events like this. These teams have uh, mobile connectivity, they have charging stations, they have a number of different resources at their disposal to help uh, those first responders or even the folks trying to get away from the disaster uh, in that moment of need. Uh, So that's one thing. The other internal piece that I think we're working on is continuing to build additional resiliency into the network. So adding additional spectrum or providing additional uh, resources to particular areas as these events are coming or as we're moving into these particular uh, times of year, I think are critical, uh, as we've all seen from a number of uh, historical responses, the ability to access information and provide critical communications uh, at the point of uh, of the disaster is is really, really important. So providing those hardened resources uh, is necessary. And, and again, we have colts and sort of cows, right? All of our farm yard of, of deployable network resources so that if infrastructure is impacted, we can quickly mobilize uh, some, uh, some other assets to provide those critical communications uh, on the front end. The other thing I would just highlight though is, is from a customer perspective, how can we help many of our first responder customers who uh, maybe didn't have as robust of a disaster recovery plan or coop plan in place prior to COVID, learn from this exercise and be ready for these other events. Uh, as this has shown us, we certainly don't always know when things are going to show up or how broad of a geographic area they're going to cover. Uh, and so helping folks to understand some of the resources that are available and how can they leverage uh, assets from Verizon or from any of my partners that are on the call today, SES or Gotenna, to be ready for an active response and to be able to spin up uh, a disaster recovery team and have the assets on hand and have the resources needed uh, to run into that crisis and be able to support it. So a couple of things we're really trying to do, supporting the internal 
uh, mechanisms at Verizon and obviously helping our customers be as prepared as possible for when those uh, secondary disasters strike. Like you said, it's not enough. We have to deal with one. It uh, seems like we always have uh, something else, you know, ready to uh, to come in and take its place. So it, it never ends. KLG, how can satellite and, and mesh networking respectively you know, help support communications during those secondary disasters, as, as John called them? Yeah, this is G from uh, CS Government Solutions, and we have a uh, communitarian assistance and disaster response uh, team that specializes in focusing on those uh, reactive scenarios. And they're still planning and prepping for all these major incidents that are likely to occur in the future and preparing to see what kind of responses and what kind of platforms or capacity will be available and ready to support when it's needed. Yeah, so this is Kale from GoTenna. I think the first thing that we have to be cognizant of is the the fact that right now personnel, response personnel, are overtaxed, um, as well as you know equipment that is continually in use right now is is being overtaxed. So we could see, or it would be the potential for a failure in critical communications equipment that is currently being used because there's no time to take it off the line before we have this next hurricane or these next tornadoes. We've already had tornadoes in Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, um, that have further taxed the personnel and the equipment. And it, as we move forward, this doesn't seem like it's going to let up anytime soon. What role can mobile mesh networking play in, in helping to support communications during those additional crises? We would fill the same roles that we've had the opportunity to do in the past, which is to support those areas that are that are worst hit, that have lost their communications infrastructure, that have lost their cell networks, and that don't have that immediate uh, um, capability to ramp back up and build those uh, infrastructure up immediately, or the support from uh, some of the other vendors that they may be utilizing. What Mesh Network allows them to do is to set up a quick ad hoc network that will provide them not only the situational awareness, but give that communications infrastructure uh, back to the community so that the community is capable of uh, communicating with its first responders. The hospitals can re can communicate with their first responders. And then we also provide that law enforcement communications network that really brings these communities back quickly, their abilities to respond uh, to ongoing emergencies. And then as part of that recovery process. Mesh network truly is a game changer because we don't require that infrastructure and we do allow uh, for that network to be mobile uh, or to expand and contract as necessary, depending on the size of the community that it's serving. So the coronavirus pandemic has had a, a profound impact on our economy and, and it's hitting state and local governments particularly hard. Gentlemen, how can agencies fund the purchase of new communications equipment? I and mean, how are they going to get the money to pay for this stuff? Hey, Ryan, it's John. That's a great question. And I want, I know that's on a number of uh, our customers' minds on a daily basis during this response. Uh, certainly there's some of the easy buttons, you know, in, in terms of uh, taking advantage of some of the uh, funding opportunities that are being uh, put uh, put out by the federal government in an effort to help support uh, private and uh, public response. And, and so I know a number of our customers are doing that. I think the other exercise, though, really that's important is to you know, take an evaluation of where current dollars are being spent. And do we have opportunities to really evolve and modernize uh, infrastructure and, and maybe find places where dollars have been spent historically that just maybe are no longer necessary? You know, again, one of the things that, that really has struck me about this particular pandemic is that it has really forced us to think about how we use uh, infrastructure. What we think of as our every day, two, three, four months ago, is certainly different today. And so I would just uh, maybe be thinking as a state and local agency, where do I have uh, resources or dollars tied up into infrastructure or into services that uh, maybe were needed uh, at a certain period in time, but now that the uh, environment has changed, I might be able to free up or move some of those dollars into a more flexible, uh, more mobile, more dynamic uh, environment in order to be able to support this uh, pandemic as well as any other upcoming uh, challenges. I know it's not an easy exercise, but certainly uh, an opportunity for us to see uh, are we being as efficient and as uh, mobile as possible and, and how do we continue to find new and 
uh, advancing technologies, whether it be a 4G or even a 5G or, you know, satellite or other mesh networking type solution. There are a lot of things that uh, customers could uh, modernize to help uh, help be more efficient and respond to uh, to some of these uh, these crises. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so with SES Government Solutions, we are focused on local, state, and federal U.S. customers. So most of our funding uh, federally comes from FEMA when they have disaster relief funds that are provided and appropriated through Congress. And then the uh, local and state, you've actually seen uh, the Speaker of the House uh, propose that in the next funding for uh, small businesses and, and disaster, you know, the pandemic response, that she wants to put a trillion dollars towards local and states that need support for dis- responding to the disaster. The coronavirus pandemic's had a profound impact on our economy, especially um, hitting our state and local governments pretty hard. How can agencies fund the purchase of new communications equipment like GoTenda Mobile Mesh Networking Solutions? You know, where will they get the money for that? I, I think the first part of that is making sure that you're frugal with uh, the budgets that you have or that you're going to receive. Um, There are a lot of very expensive solutions out there. And then there are uh, solutions that are much more scalable and and cost effective. I would say mesh networking is one of those very cost effective uh, solutions. And when you're looking at those types of solutions, one of the ones that I used to key in on um, was the state homeland security program, uh, because that one is, while it's, still has some very specific requirements. It's a, it's a lot broader in the use cases that you can, for the equipment that you can purchase, whether you're buying mesh networks or whether you're buying out whole uh, radio systems, that particular grant program will support uh, those types of solutions because of the interoperability, because of its ability to go out and, and help communities mitigate um, and then recover from uh, disasters. There are several of them out there. We've got some papers that we've uh, written and posted up on the last mile. We'd be happy for you to go take a look at it. But the uh, State Homeland Security Program is probably the first one that I would key in on if I were an emergency manager or a a, uh, chief of fire police. So one of the things that we uh, we saw happen as a response to the pandemic was the passage of the CARES Act. And I understand that in addition to some support for small businesses and, and folks who might need some money because the economic hardships of, of this pandemic, there also was some provisions in there for the expansion of things like telemedicine and telehealth, and also to enable that some of the, uh, the expansion of rural broadband and connectivity. Uh, John, can you elaborate a little bit on maybe what some of those provisions were and, and why they're important or essential right now? Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. It's a good question. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have been very proud of at uh, Verizon is our ongoing partnership with the VA. Uh, and as we think about this pandemic, uh, you know, some of the folks that uh, are most impacted are those who are in rural communities who are being asked to stay at home. Uh, And if I'm a veteran who already lives in a very rural area and doesn't have quick access to a doctor or a VA facility or even a VA clinic, how can we help provide, you know, critical care and services for those uh, those types of folks? Uh, So we've worked closely with the VA to provide an expanded uh, uh, solution and service to their telehealth office and their their office of connected care. Uh, in which we're working to expand tablet uh, deployment and you know virtual connectivity for a lot of these veterans, so that as they're at home, uh, staying safe or or recovering, if they happen to be uh, impacted directly by COVID-19, they're able to connect virtually with a doctor. They're able to connect with other veterans through a community of uh, uh, the communications, and and you know continue to have ongoing dialogue and stay mentally healthy, as well as uh, work on becoming physically healthy or staying that way. So being able to really provide these services to folks, not just in metro areas, but in rural America, uh, I think has been a critical uh, critical change and something I, I hope we can continue to expand, uh, bringing these services and bringing that critical care to uh, to everyone across the country. And, you know, what a great honor it is to be able to serve the veterans of this country uh, and provide them with uh, services and a reliable connection and, and uh, that critical services back to their doctors or to their communities uh, to be able to stay uh, connected and and uh, and obviously recover and get better as they uh, as they support uh, themselves through this this crisis. 
Gee, I, I've often heard stories of, of satellite being an effective uh, a tool for sending uh, you know, capacity, capability, communications out to, to some of the most rural, most geographically isolated areas. And those are areas that will also inevitably be, be impacted by the pandemic. You know, can you talk a little bit about the role that satellite plays in that and maybe provide an example of, uh, in the past, uh, a, a place or, or a situation in which satellite has enabled connectivity to a place that was relatively remote? Yeah, so a lot of carriers um, use satellite as a backup or as the a primary link to get uh, cell towers in rural parts of the country connected up. And then we have uh, multiple contracts in places that are 100% rural all the time, like Alaska, where there's just so limited communications that um, utilizing satellite has been their key method of disseminating emergency service messages to people in different parts of the uh, state who you know have no other way of really getting communications back and forth because they're so far away from uh, you know what we would consider normal civilization. Excellent. Well, you've been listening to the Government Technology Insider podcast. Uh, John, Kale, G, I, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to speak to us from the confines of your coronavirus shelters. It, it's been a pleasure speaking to all three of you, and I, I hope you uh, will join us again for future episodes. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you and share some thoughts on uh, how we can best support you know users and customers and uh, the country as a whole. Thank you very much for taking the time to uh, listen to this podcast as well as uh, for you to put this podcast on. We, we know that it's beneficial to the agencies uh, that we all serve, especially during this critical time. Ryan, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity and thanks for having us. Stay safe and hopefully you're uh, doing well in your shelter as well. <laughs> And I'm doing well enough as could be expected during a global pandemic. Thank you for asking, John. Uh, I would like to thank you, our our listeners as well, uh, for joining us for this podcast and conversation. If you liked what you heard here today, I'd encourage you to check out the Government Technology Insider and the Government Satellite Report for even more content like this.